Ah, well, let's begin. I'm Lisa Lippincott. I'm here to talk about locally atomic capabilities and how to count them. That's a bit of a mouthful. So I'm going to start by talking about me. In my other hat, I'm a mathematical logician. I study formal languages, how they express meaning, how proofs fit together. Um, and both in that hat and um, in my programming hat, for pretty much my entire adult life, I've been wondering about one variation or another of this question. Why don't we routinely have computers check that our reasoning about our programs is mathematically sound? That is a little overstated. Type systems do a sort of check like this. But I think we can all agree that we are not very good at having computers check that our reasoning about our programming is mathematically sound. Um, about, yes, if you have a question, speak up. Um, about 10 years ago-ish, 15, I don't know, sometime in the past, I came to a conclusion about this. Here's my conclusion. It's not that our reason is, is usually unsound. We notice that we have bugs. They loom large in our mind. But we are actually very good at writing code. Most of our code works. We just notice in a big way the bits that don't. Um, it's not that we can't write formally enough for a computer. We are very good at putting together formal languages and writing programs in them. But I think it's the way we, that the way we write proofs is so contrary to the way we write programs that it's very difficult to write both at once. If you go back two years ago, I talked about inductions to make sure that your function exits. Um, literally, you have to start the induction with the return statement and work backwards. Um, if, you turn it, if you turn your program into a proof, it gets flipped upside down. Um, and there are a lot of other ways in which the way we talk about the mathematics is contrary from the way we talk about particularly procedural programs. So then we can move on to the next question. How can we make it easier to write programs and proofs at the same time? And there are two obvious approaches here. One is to find a way to write programs more like the way we write mathematics. And other people have been trying that for a long time. Um, or we can find a way to write mathematics the way we write programs. And so I set out to find the mathematics that works for procedural programmers. <coughs> and today I'm going to be talking about a sort of fantasy C++ that has some extensions. And each of these extensions, I'm hoping, will feel like programming to all of you. But they will also be mathematics. So I want it to be mathematics that works like programming, that you have a decent feel for how you might use. And of course, it's new. It might take some practice. So enough about me. Last year, I introduced a notation for a function interface with a slide much like this. My syntax is slightly changed from last year. The idea is that a function interface is a kind of intermediate function body that wraps around the function implementation. So to execute the function, you first execute the prologue and then the implementation. And then when the function implementation returns, you execute the epilogue. Um, and the point is that the function interface is visible both to the caller and to the implementation. And this lets us do something nifty. It lets us divide our reasoning into two neighborhoods. We have a calling neighborhood which 
consists of the, the pre-call region in the caller, the prologue of the function, the epilogue of the function, and the post-call region of the caller, but not the implementation of the function. And likewise, we have an implementation neighborhood that consists of the prologue of the function, the implementation of the function, and the epilogue, but not the caller. And by reasoning about these separately, but noticing that they have to agree on the overlapping region, we can build up reasoning about our entire programming, our, our entire program. I call this local reasoning. This is what I mean by local. It's working one neighborhood at a time and only looking within that neighborhood for our answers about what works and what doesn't. Um, an important thing to know as we go forward is that within the interface, um, we assign responsibility for problems to either the caller or the implementation. The caller is responsible for anything that goes wrong in the prologue. The implementation is responsible for anything that goes wrong in the epilogue. If the caller can't make the prologue work correctly, it shouldn't call the function. If the implementation can't make the epilogue work correctly, it shouldn't return. And that's where we're going to get the strength of that overlapping. Um, it lets us communicate because the implementation can see that the prologue must have worked correctly and the caller can see after the function that the epilogue must have worked correctly. And this lets them communicate with each other. <coughs> so that's local. Local is looking at something from a single neighborhood's point of view. Um, in this picture, you might think of most of the rest of the talk as happening in the caller point of view. Um, the circle in the middle is particularly interesting. Uh, something mysterious happens in the calling neighborhood in between the prologue and the epilogue. <coughs> and we know it's execution of the implementation. And the implementation may be a very complex arrangement of possibilities of events, because that's what a function specifies, an arrangement of possibilities of events. Um, but from the caller's point of view, the implementation is a single event. It just happens. It's an atomic event. Now, it's not truly atomic because we know the implementation body is complicated. But from the caller's point of view, it's atomic. It's locally atomic. So that's two words out of our title. The implementation is a locally atomic event from the caller's point of view. <sighs> so moving forward, um, I'm going to introduce a few example functions. Here are three functions. In my opinion, the first one is a much better function than the other two. <laughs> First one, good function. Middle one, bad function. Third one, bad function. And I think you will see why, you know, I think you have some idea in your head why these two are bad functions and why that one is better. But I want to approach this from a purely local point of view. We're going to discuss why the first one is good and the second two are bad without reference to anything outside the function, outside the neighborhood. Um, and if you ask people why the first one is good and why the second two are bad, they might tell you a story that says there is some omnipresent entity called the heap and the heap bestows favor on some pointers and disfavors other pointers. 
And in the first one, we see that there is a pointer favored by the heap. And in the middle one, we see there is a pointer not favored by the heap. And in the third one, there is a pointer that was once favored by the heap that has fallen into disfavor. <laughs> but the heap, being an omnipresent entity, has no place in our local reasoning. We will speak no more of this heap. Instead, we're going to look at the neighborhood that we're in. And I'm going to focus now on the first um, function here, foo. Um, and let's imagine that we had an interface for new and delete, two interfaces, new and delete. They might look something like this. Um, in new, the implementation happens. And then after the implementation, we can claim that the result is deletable. Um, here, claim is a kind of assertion. Um, it's the, it is the assertion that says, not only will this assertion succeed, but the reason for it succeeding is in the responsible neighborhood. So the reason for this pointer being deletable needs to be in the responsible neighborhood for the epilogue of new, which would be the implementation um, neighborhood of new. Likewise, the reason for it still being deletable, for P being deletable when we delete the pointer, is it needs to be, the reason has to be in the responsible neighborhood, which is the calling neighborhood because it's a prologue. That is, foo is responsible for making sure that p is deletable when it deletes it. And that, I think, should agree with your vision of how, ah, yes. So the claim, the second claim in delete is very different than the first claim in new. Like in some uh, way. It, it is in a different context. Oh, the question is, is the second claim very different from the first claim? It's in a different context. A different neighborhood is responsible for it. On the other hand, claim is just, uh, claim is just saying that, this, that the responsible neighborhood knows why this is true. It's actually there in part to distinguish it from posit, which is the, re which is the assertion that says, the responsible neighborhood might have no idea why this is true, but it's going to be true anyway. Well, I'm wondering that the second claim, like say you had a whole implementation behind all this, the, the, and the first claim kind of just sets a flag on the pointer, you know, saying it is deletable, but the bottom one checks that flag. When you delete, you're not, uh, a certain, you know, you're not making it deletable here. You are take, you're checking that the flag is still there, saying it's deletable. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, so the, um, you're imagining a. You know, I'm going to try and repeat the question. Um, you're imagining a scheme in which you have a flag that is set um, in deletable uh, that, that is set associated with the pointer by one of these claims and checked in the other one of these claims. And you're not entirely off. Um, but I will point out that if you're checking the implementation neighborhood, you need to reverse that behavior. Um, so really, even there, the way you implement the claim, you know, if you are going to go for a really interesting check, depends on who's responsible. Did you have a question? Uh, just a, another way of phrasing that, I think, that they're both kind of checking the flag, but in the one case, it's the, it's the implementation of new that is responsible for setting the flag, and in the other case, it's the caller that is responsible uh, for setting the flag. Right. So they're different in that, in one case, I am responsible for this claim, and in the other case, you are responsible for this claim, but from the other guy's point of view, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I will summarize. <laughs> Um, the, the comment is, if there was a flag, it would be, it, it would be the responsible neighborhood that sets the flag. Um, 
it would, no, it would be the responsible neighborhood. Um, and I'm going to say kind of yes, but I think that you are, that that is a bit limited by the idea that there's only one flag. Yes. I think a better analogy here is to replace claim the leadable with something like assert not nil at the beginning of the function, let's say, which mm -hmm. is not setting a flag on that pointer, but it is letting the compiler say, oh wait, if I reach past this assertion, I don't have to do any nil check. So for not nil, yeah. no, no. Um, well, probably. yeah, so the, sure, like, the heart of the comment is that part, if you think of claim as an assertion, then responsibility is about who needs to make sure that assertion is true. Um, and I think I'm going to kill the rat any more discussion on that one because by the end of the talk, there will be a better answer. <laughs> um, uh, I do want to point out uh, the way deletable connects the epilogue of new to the prologue of delete is actually something that philosophers have a word for. They call two words. They call this a causal nexus. The, it is the connection between cause and effect. And for a couple thousand years, I think, philosophers have been trying to figure out what the nature of a causal nexus is. And I am not going to answer that question, <laughs> but I am going to say, I can tell one when I see it. A causal nexus involves the epilogue of one event um, claim, er, asserting a capability which goes on to be asserted in the prologue of a following event. That's a causal nexus. Huh. So, um, moving back to our function. Ah, yes, there's a problem with that previous slide. That wasn't the right interface for new and delete. Because we know that new and delete are each composed of a pair of operations, and this is really exposed to the caller. New is allocation and construction, and delete is destruction and deallocation. So this is actually a better interface, a more accurate interface for new and delete. It's not entirely accurate because I made a whole bunch of simplifications to make it clear on the slide. So there's that asterisk there. But in the, base, in the very, very basic case, new says, I'm doing two things. Delete says, I'm doing two things. Useful fact here, I consider an inline function that has no implementation statement to be all, to be entirely exposed to its caller. So new and delete here are part of the calling neighborhood. They're also conveniently part of the calling neighborhood's translation unit. So each neighborhood is going to still fit within a translation unit. Yes. Can you just explain why? Uh, why, why you'd make that assumption about inline functions? The question is, why would I make that assumption about inline functions? Um, the answer really is, you need something like that, and inline functions have exactly the semantics you need. Uh -huh. So we could have two things with exactly the same semantics that mean something slightly different logically. I didn't think that was a good way to go. Okay. Um, so anyway, this division of deletability into two parts, the deallocatability and the destructability, you can't really see that you know, those two intermediate lines have different lengths there. But deletability really has to split into two parts. So this is how I'm going to define deletability. That's deletability. And here I've introduced another bit of um, uh, of language, which is also mathematics. I should maybe back up. I didn't say much about the language being mathematics. Um, neighborhoods are constructing a sheaf structure on the arrangement of, of possibilities of events that is our programming. 
and claim and posit are quantifiers on execution. Claim is an existential quantifier over execution paths. Posit is a universal quantifier over execution paths. Um, so here I'm introducing another bit of thing that looks like programming. It is programming, but it's also math. And it's require, which introduces a partial assertion. It's something that you can assert without saying or that you can talk about asserting without actually telling which way it's going to go, where the reason is going to come from. So if I say claim deletable, I'm claiming both destructible and deallocatable. Posit deletable is positing both destructible and deallocatable. So this is just require is a way to build up more assertions from smaller assertions. And with that, oh, yes, um, please. Can you just clarify what the distinction is in this world between claim and posit? Claim, so the question is, what's the distinction between claim and posit? Claim is the reason for the assertion holding is in the responsible neighborhood. Posit, which you should use much less often, um, you, there will posit, I don't think there's a po another, there's a posit in this entire slide deck. Um, but posit is saying that the reason that the assertion will hold is outside the responsible neighborhood and possibly outside the program entirely. It turns out you can't get away with a life completely without posit. So, we now know what deletable is. And now we've got two problems. <coughs> yes. Yeah, so you can delete a null pointer. <laughs> um, it's true, I did skimp in this place and one other, one other that I didn't. Oh, the question is yes, you can delete a null pointer. And no, you can't destroy a null pointer. So, um, so I did actually skimp on the if p is not equal to null putter here, and I will point out the other place where I skimped. Um, yes? Tying this back to contracts and how you use assertions, I think the difference between claim and posit is something along the lines of if you're claiming it, you can assert it. If you're positing it, you better check it, much like uh, reading a file and having bad syntax. You don't claim the syntax in the file is good, you posit it, right? Um, so John suggests a style point, which I won't say I disagree with, but I think it is early to tell. Um, that he suggests that if it's a claim, you can get away without checking it at runtime. But if it's a posit, you should always check it at runtime. And I think that is a style that might be reasonable to promote, but I think some people will reject that style, perhaps for their own very good reasons. But it's consistent with the terminology you're using. Posit uh, could be wrong. Uh, so, claim can't be wrong. So, John says, posit can be wrong, claim can't be wrong. If your program is going to run correctly, neither the posits nor the claims can be wrong. Claims can be proved, and if the proof is correct, then uh, you know if you've carefully checked the proof, um, you might believe the claim strongly enough that you don't feel a need to test it. And it's difficult to say the same thing about posit, but perhaps some people are so confident in their very few posits that they will never check those. Uh, moving along, unless... Yeah, moving along, um, we have two problems, destructible and deallocatable now. And I'm going to go with deallocatable. So let's look at the usage. Here is a function very much like our old function. Just, it's just using operator new and operator delete and skipping the whole construction destruction thing. 
Um, and here we have what I think are legit interfaces for operator new and operator delete. Um, operator new, it's very easy to get through the prologue of operator new. And if operator new returns to you, you will have writable bytes and you will have deallocatability. And if you're going to call operator delete, you had better have some writable bytes and some deallocatability to give it. Um, and I think that's, yes, Alistair. Is it important for operator delete that the bytes are writable? Ah, good question. Why is it important for operator delete that the bytes are writable? And I think that would become clear, but I, I will step outside our purely local frame and imagine that you are implementing operator delete. Uh, you might decide someday that somebody else should use those bytes. And if somebody else is going to use those bytes, they'd better be writable. <coughs> so the writability has to go back to the heap that we have banished from our neighborhood. Um, I will. Yes, Bryce. I mean, when, you wouldn't be able to destroy the object if it's not writable, right? It's a, it's this is, okay, Bryce asks about destroying the object if it's not writable. Yeah, it's In this case, there is no object to be destroyed. Yes. We're not doing construction destruction. And destructibility has its own, uh, destructibility, it turns out, needs to have different flavors for different const qualifiers. But not talking about destructibility right so, now. So Uh, the comment is that it is that you you would need uh, you would need operator new to produce writable bytes because otherwise you wouldn't be able to construct an object. But really, in a sense, the point of operator new is to get some writable bytes. Yeah. Um, yes, Alistair. I was trying to wonder, work out if the writable bytes is effectively a necessary claim for deallocatable at this point, the way you're tying it, because you want them to be writable we, afterwards. Well, I think if that's not answered at the end of the talk, tell me. Um, because <coughs> I, I, I will tell you right up front, you know, when I talk about um, new giving us writable bytes and deallocatable, and, and delete taking away the writable bytes and deallocatable. I'm talking about these things, these capabilities, in a way that we don't talk about mathematical facts. I don't give you two plus two equals four. I might tell you two plus two equals four, and then we both know it. Capabilities don't have the math of mathematical facts. Capabilities, viewed locally, have the math of stuff. If I give writable bytes and deallocatable to operator delete here, I no longer have them. And that's kind of the theme of this talk, is that the correct math to view capabilities locally is the math of stuff. Yes, Alistair. If, if I, translating back from what I just heard, if I have claims in the, uh, the, the prologue of an interface, I am immediately giving up and assume the epilogue, those claims no longer hold unless they are repeated in the epilogue. Is that the... Uh, the, the um, oh, the, yes, the question is that if you have a claim in the prologue, are you giving up the fact that they hold as the implementation by the fact that they are in the prologue. And the answer is, to some extent, yes, details will follow. Intuitively, uh, we've got like operator delete here in the prologue, we're claiming writable bytes. So it's true there. But then in the, in the epilogue, we don't see claim writable bytes. So it's not necessarily true. That, that was my if you so. 
Well, the comment is that after we delete, the implementation makes the bytes not writable anymore. But I will say the implementation probably doesn't actually make the bytes not writable anymore. The implementation, it, what, what's important is that locally, the, the, the bytes are not writable. They are not writable to us. If they are writable at all, they're writable to somebody else. Ah, so, moving right along, definition of deallocatable. Here is my definition for deallocatable. And I will say this is the other place where I skimped out on the null pointer thing. Um, there should be a little thing in there for that. And I looked at it and I thought that's just going to confuse people. Um, so this is deallocatable at least not for non-null pointers. And require implementation is a special kind of implementation statement. It's saying it is as if we had required whatever is in the implementation body, but the implementation body is outside your neighborhood. So it, you're, we are, if you assert this, you are asserting a pig in a poke. Um, and I chose, in fact, deallocatable specifically because I don't think most of us there may be an exception or two in the room, but I don't think most of us know exactly what deallocatable means to, the impl to our implementation. We know it's something we get from operator new and it's something that we need for operator delete, but it's something about a free list or memory blocks colliding or who knows what. Um, so this is how you can express this. It indicates a capability that is implemented outside the neighborhood. And to the caller, such a capability is locally atomic. So there's the title, of, uh, the main part of the title of our talk. Locally atomic <laughs> capabilities are require implementation. And at this point, you might be wondering What's the big deal about being atomic? Is anybody wondering that? Just me? Yeah. <laughs> um, and for an answer to that, let's go to John Dalton. John Dalton gave us interfaces like this. I don't know if the notation is his, but he basically laid the foundation for them. Here we have four hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms combining into two water molecules. And the rules behind this idea of atomic were very simple. First, atoms are conserved. They can't be created or destroyed. And that's why if we count six atoms on the left side of this um, interface, we will also see six atoms on the right side of this interface. Locally, uh, these are conserved atoms. Um, Dalton also said, atoms can be rearranged, but they don't change. The hydrogen remains hydrogen, the oxygen remains oxygen. <coughs> so if we count the hydrogen, there's four on the left, four on the right, if we count the oxygen, there's two on the left, two on the right. I'll point out that in this interface, molecules don't have either of these properties. On the left-hand side, we have three molecules. We only have two molecules on the right. And we have hydrogen molecules and oxygen <coughs> molecules on the left, but water molecules on the right. So molecules are not conserved and Molecules change. And the last rule of atoms is that atoms are the, of the same kind are interchangeable. There isn't any sense of this oxygen atom went, th went to that water and this oxygen atom went to that water in, in this interface. Oxygen is just oxygen. 
And with those three rules, we developed this wonderful science of chemistry. And for like a hundred years, everything was great. And then some joker named Rutherford puts some thorium in a jar and the jar starts filling up with helium. It turns out atoms were not atomic after all. And so chemistry was ruined. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> turns out we can still do chemistry today. We just make a distinction between chemical reactions and nuclear reactions. Chemistry happens in different neighborhoods than nuclear decay. So, if we want to change this to, exp uh, to make things local, um, we can say local atoms are locally conserved. Local atoms aren't created or destroyed locally. In a chemistry neighborhood, chemistry atoms are conserved. In a nuclear physics neighborhood, nuclear atoms are conserved. Nuclear atomic <laughs> things, that is. Uh, in this equation, nucleons are conserved. That is, those numbers across the top, they balance out. Um, the numbers across the bottom, sadly, are not conserved because that's proton number, and protons are not conserved in nuclear decay. Um, I will say, um, there, at some point, somebody looked at what was going on in this sort of reaction and thought, hey, angular momentum is supposed to come in, in atoms. There are atomic increments of angular momentum. And notice that, it didn't, that this equation didn't balance. The reason it didn't balance is because they hadn't put the neutrinos in. And so they went looking for something they'd overlooked that took away four atoms of angular momentum. And sure enough, there are neutrinos. So now we know about neutrinos. Um, and in fact, the way they detected them at first was noticing that the angular momentum appears in another reaction nearby. <laughs> They basically reversed the thing, caught the neutrinos, and, and found that they suddenly had extra <coughs> angular momentum. So let's move on. Local atoms don't change in the local neighborhood. If you're doing chemistry, your hydrogen remains hydrogen, and your oxygen remains oxygen. There might be some nuclear physics somewhere else that makes them not do that. There, in fact, is. But in your neighborhood, hydrogen is hydrogen, oxygen is oxygen. And finally, local atoms of the same kind are interchangeable in the local neighborhood, but they might have differences that matter to other neighborhoods. So the oxygen might come in different isotopes that matter in a nuclear reaction. But they're not good. But as far as a chemical reaction goes, one oxygen is just like another oxygen. And I should, for the credit of the chemists, there are, you know, physical chemists are a, are a different breed of, chem of chemists than, you know, early chemists. And there, there, are I there are intermediate neighborhoods here. But the point is, this idea of neighborhood lets, our, let, lets us talk about a restricted amount of information, both in, in space, in time, and scale. So we have neighborhoods down from the quantum mechanical out to the galactic cluster scale, and we, can, and we think about them differently by not actually spending a lot of time on the quantum mechanics when we're thinking about galactic clusters. And the same thing applies to your program. Main should be at a different scale than deletable. <laughs> um, 
So, getting back to the programming. Here is our picture of how operator new and operator delete relate to each other. Writable bytes and deallocatability flow from one to the other. And again, I'm using this idea of flow. Um, I'm treating these things as, as atoms that move from one event to another. Here, in the, imp the, the implementation of operator new produces, from our point of view, a capability that we had never seen before. So suddenly it comes into our neighborhood, and the implementation of operator delete takes the capability out of our neighborhood. Now, we don't know whether the capability still exists or not somewhere else because we're not, we don't care about what's going on in other neighborhoods. It's gone from ours, and that's all we need to know. But this transit of um, atoms from one neighborhood to another lets us use a bit of math called Stokes' theorem. An analog of Stokes' theorem, actually. Stokes' theorem says we can integrate across a boundary to find out thing, how things inside the boundary affect things outside the boundary and vice versa. So in this case, if we look at the boundary of operator new, we notice that an atom of deallocatability flows outward from operator new and an atom of deallocatability flows inward to operator delete. Um, and that's how we're going to count the atoms. We're going to watch them as they traverse interfaces. But there's a problem. Stokes' theorem requires a thin boundary. It's one usually one dimensional, uh, one dimension smaller than the thing uh, than the space you're operating uh, operating in. Sorry, um, and here we actually have two boundaries with a with the with the interface in between them. So, the implementation of operator new has its own boundary, and Operator new, the interface, has a separate boundary, and there's a gap in between. Now, you might think nothing is supposed to happen in the gap in between. People will tell you, that stuff's supposed to be pure. There need to be no side effects. There is no such thing as computation without side effects. If you're not contributing to the heat death of the universe, you're not doing anything at all. And up close, a little more to the point, if say you wanted to compare two strings in the interface, <coughs> you're going to create a pointer, you're going to create two pointers, you're going to walk the pointers along the strings, incrementing them. Right there, side effects. The important thing is not that you don't have side effects. The important thing is that the side effects don't matter. And in particular, the, you can, and this gets back to Stokes' theorem, there's a cheat for Stokes' theorem. You can treat a thick boundary as thin as long as there is no net flux uh, within, the, within the interface. So the idea is any capability that enters the interface for operator new also goes to the implementation of operator new. Any capability that comes out of the implementation of operator new comes out of the interface of operator new. Same thing for operator delete. We have our, ad our atom of deallocatability goes into oper the interface of operator delete, and so it must, we need to prove that, that atom of deallocatability reaches the implementation of operator delete. But, a capability that comes from something that happens from some call or operation inside the interface, declare a pointer, making it readable and writable, um, that capability remains in the interface. 
it can't go to the implementation, and it can't go to the caller. And there's a similar effect. I'm not going to try and draw it, but a similar effect it applies to changes. The capabilities that transit both boundaries have to remain unchanged. But the capabilities that are, that, that are created and vanish within the interface um, don't have to remain unchanged. They can have side effects, and neither the caller nor the implementation is going to be any the wiser. And that gives us a nifty property. If we want to, we can run the interface twice. We can run it once in the calling context and once in the called context. And we can, we, we can instrument the interface differently in those two contexts. Vitally, um, if somebody compiles a library with interface checking totally turned off, you can compile your unit that calls that library with checks of that library's interface on your side. Vice versa, if you happen to be the one being called. So it's OK if we execute the interface twice, because the same capabilities cross the boundary twice, and those capabilities are unchanged as they cross both boundaries. Um, Useful property. It all, yes? Does that mean that you cannot have side effects in your interface? Because otherwise, it's too bad. The question is does that mean you can't have side effects in your interface? And the answer is exactly not that. <laughs> <laughs> the answer, as I was trying to get across before, is that you can have side effects. You will have side effects. But, you need to have a particular kind of side effect that neither the caller nor the implementation is going to be able to detect. Ah, which is what he thought of as not having side effects. Yes. If I can quite, quite correctly, you can have side effects as long as they do not affect this neighborhood. They can affect other neighborhoods. Yes, um, Alistair points out you can have side effects that don't affect this neighborhood, these neighborhoods, I should say, the caller or implementation, but they might affect other neighborhoods. And in fact, they will affect other neighborhoods because you're going to do that string compare and you're going to be calling less than and you're going to, you're going to have the neighborhood of operator less on characters um, know about the things that you did, um, to some extent. <laughs> um, this also means we can go the other direction. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah. So would another example of it affecting another neighborhood be, for example, a spike in uh, CPU usage? Ah. Another, uh, the point is, um, another example of it affecting of this interface affecting another um, neighborhood would be that there might be a spike in CPU usage. And absolutely, there might be a spike in CPU usage. There might be heat given off. We will get closer to the heat death of the universe as we actually do things in our interface. Um, yes. That would be a good time to ask. You said, see, you're talking, you were talking about side effects in, in contract assertions. Is this the right time to ask the question? Uh, the question is, is this the right time to ask a question about side effects in contract assertions? And I would say definitely not yet. Um, you might want to hold that for the end. Okay. Um, or see if you are still interested in asking it at the end. Um, so we can go the other direction with this, which will help us contribute less to the heat death of the universe. If we're confident that our interface will work, that our interface will be satisfied, um, then if we don't call the interface at all, if we don't execute anything in the interface, neither the caller nor the implementation should be any the wiser. I'll point out there's a, uh, that 
all of these rules that add up to thinness in the Stokes theorem sense also apply to assertions in a different assertions need to be thin sense. So I won't get deeply into that, but similar rules have, need to apply to assertions. Um, okay, with that in hand, with Stokes' theorem and the ability to count things as they go across an interface, we can count up the capabilities in those functions I showed you earlier. So um, here we can look at which operations produce and remove deallocatability from our neighborhood. And we see that in the first example, everything balances out to zero in the end, and the deallocatability never goes negative. We never tried to spend deallocatability that we didn't have. In the second and third examples, we spend, uh, we, the deallocatability does go negative. We spend deallocatability that we were hoping maybe to have or just mistakenly thought or who knows why we wrote that. It was an example. I know why I wrote that. I wanted them to be wrong. Yes? So assuming we could have um, a pass tool or something that didn't delete at all and demonstrate that leaking the point, it would also... Yes. Yes. Leaking, leaking deallocatability. You see, deallocatability has to be conserved. If your neighborhood ends, it has to go somewhere else. So any capabilities that are left over at the end of your neighborhood, when your neighborhood will be no more, must cross some boundary into must cross the boundary into your calling neighborhood. Um, so yes, not having zero at the end of your neighborhood, which by the way, should include your epilogue, but these don't have interfaces slapped on them, so there's no epilogue to be seen. Um, but capabilities in your epilogue count. Um, so if there's a function that's calling one of these functions, like one that leaks memory, with the contract of this function itself, is there like an implicit assertion that the total deallocatability is zero when it ends? Ah, the question is, if there is some other function in, you know, other neighborhood that has already leaked things, um, does, that does that change the logic of these? And while I don't understand it very well, I can, I, I can refer you to gauge theory. <laughs> um, we're only interested in local deallocatability. What's going on in the rest of the universe? We are symmetric with respect to the deallocatability in the rest of the universe. So we're only counting what happens in our neighborhood. You were first. And obviously, it's per pointer. I can't create two pointers and oh. one of them twice and say, well, I'm at zero. I won't repeat that, but it's the next slide. Yes. <laughs> I was going to ask if you have a slide that rather than having functions returning void, as a function returning a deallocatable pointer, so you are deliberately creating the, or ah. the edge of your neighborhood. A Alistair asks if I have a slide that shows a function returning a deallocatable pointer, and I don't have a slide showing the implementation of such a function, but you saw the interface for such a function because operator knew returns a deallocatable pointer, it mentions the deallocatability in its epilogue, thereby letting both the caller and implementation know that an atom of deallocatability flows outward from operator new. Huh. Yes, the, the, the point made was that it doesn't have to balance to zero. I will slightly rephrase. It has to balance. So at the end of your implementation, what you have to have left over needs to be exactly the number of atoms transiting your epilogue. So the next slide is, and I, I want to point out, this right here, this will catch bugs. If we had interfaces that specified the 
that specified deallocatability. This would catch real bugs. Yes? Just to confirm, this is not statically checkable, right? Let's say you have four loop, your, your, your bounds, you know. You ah, yeah, I, I, I will cut you short on that question. He wishes to confirm that this is not statically checkable. I will confirm that this is not statically checkable this early in the talk. Uh, <laughs> so, I, let's move on. This is where it goes wrong. Here we have um, two calls to new, two calls to delete. The program is wrong, but it balances when we sum up the deallocatability. And that's because deallocatability of P and deallocatability of Q are not interchangeable atoms of deallocatability. They're different they have different elements. Element one is not element eight. So really, we need to do this sum. If we sum up deallocatability of P and sum up deallocatability of Q in this program, we see that we have leaked P and um, double deleted Q. And summing up catches both of those errors if we are smart enough to sum those two elements into different bins. I should say, if you want to do this, if you want fast, you don't have to separate the bins. Addition works that way. But if you want, if you want to catch every error, you have to separate the bins. Yes? Yeah, so a part of your uh, allocatability atom is the size of? Ah, right. yes. A, a... So, so what if I like, uh, allocate the, uh, the right class, assign the base pointer, and delete for that base pointer? OK. First point. Part of my deallocatability here is the size of. Second point is, what if there's a derived class? You will remember there, that um, I said I was ignoring polymorphic classes in this case. Okay. Um, deallocatable without knowing the type, without knowing the amount of writable bytes you're losing is an interesting is an is an interesting example of something very much like type erasure. It is size erasure. Somewhere in your program, you're going to have to keep track of which bytes you can't write anymore when you deallocate that. So somehow we're going to have to work around it, and it gets considerably more complicated. But Let's stick to the simple one that expresses the size. Yes. But that means you will. You, you, I, I see how that's implemented. I think that can be done. And then you'll catch someone who deleted from the base and it wasn't a virtual destructor. Ah, the comment is that, um, that if you implement this and he sees how, um, that if you delete, uh, that you can catch deleting from a base that's not a virtual destructor, um, I'm. That had better be the case when we're done. I'm not entire, you know, I haven't worked out every line of how. So uh, there are some weirdnesses of that particular operation that are, that need work. <laughs> ah. <coughs> so, um, I'm afraid I've kind of lost my train of thought here. Oh, yes. How do we tell one deallocatable from another? How do we know they are that these are different elements? And how would we know when they are the same element? So let, that's going to have to be expressed in the interface to deallocatable. To deallocatable. So here's the interface for deallocatable. I'm going to try and pick up the pace a bit here. Um, something that people who came to my talk last year will remember is that while this interface looks very simple, I believe that there should be implicit assertions added to a, a set of implicit assertions, which I call the basic interface, added to 
every interface to say the things that are really boring to say in every interface. And here are the implicit assertions that belong in deallocatable. Um, the blue dot is what I use to express that these assertions are implicit. You don't have to write them down. They get written for you. So I'm saying P and S here, the pointer and the size, both need to be proper coming in and need to be proper going out. So I get those without writing them. What is this proper? Proper is means the usual thing for the CV qualified type. In the case of a void star or a size t, proper is both readable and writable. Writable in this case is a bit of a red herring. We didn't really have to declare those parameters non-const. So I'm going to change that and say, I'll declare those parameters const for the sake of argument. Now, proper means readable in both cases. So we are asserting coming in that we can read from P and that we can read from S. I will point out, not read from star P, read from P, we can read the pointer value. And yes, if you really worked at it, you could construct a call where that might not be possible, maybe. Let's not. Um, yes, Alistair. An example is there some architectures where registers can only hold if it addresses that are very specific to that, and they might flag up with a signal or something, so that you're, you can't even read that value because it's not a proper memory address. So yes. Al Alistair points out that on some architectures, there might be a flag that says you can't read from a certain memory address. Uh, more generally, if we are just looking at the, at the program statically, you know, maybe, the, maybe S was actually star of null pointer um, with a cast on it. But you and, can still read the null pointer value. Uh, he uh, says you can... Architectures where you store pointers in special addresses a, might yes. be a, a, Yes. Uh, Al Alistair says something about architectures which I really don't think contributes to the talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> But he's pretty much right. I'm not sure there's such a distinction between what you said and what I said, but let's go on. Um, so um, let's, so somehow readable communicates the fact that we are carrying information that tells us this deallocatable is different from that deallocatable. And that's what I, what, where I'm trying to go with this. Capabilities can carry information with them. Some of them do. Hiding inside a locally atomic capability might be information that the calling neighborhood is aware exists, but has no way to interact with directly. That the local neighborhood has no way to interact with directly, but can detect effects because of things that are happening within other uh, that are happening in other neighborhoods. So with that in mind, let's look at what readable is. Here's readable. So volatile readable is just a blank. It's require implementation, locally atomic capability and nothing else. Um, Non-volatile readable is a little more complicated. You can't claim non-volatile readable without also claiming volatile readable. And that's really how they work. You, you can't use a purely non-volatile thing. You, volatile access has to be possible. Uh, a note on this bit addressable. People might remember it from last year. Um, that's actually a bizarre, an annoying syntax that I would like to replace, but it indicates that the implicit assertions, instead of being proper, are going to be addressable. Addressable, addressable is a fundamental capability that I don't think can be expressed in the language, um, but we can have a name for it. So here, 
volatile readable does not require volat does not claim volatile readable as a precondition. That would be circular. It does, however, um, claim addressable as a precondition. Same thing, regular readable has a precondition of addressable and a postcondition that the thing is still addressable. And writable, whoops, I'll take those away. Um, writable similarly um, includes the non-volatile one, requires the volatile capability. Um, but there is something weird going on. Writable also requires readable. In some sense, readability is latent within writability. And that's a little complicated. So I drew a picture. Here's what volatile readable looks like. It is very simple. Just an atomic capability all by itself. Simplest possible capability. I will point out simple in interface. Doing that read might flush your cache, raise some electrons to different poten uh, to p potentials, um, start up a, you know, spin up a hard disk on a machine that's across a network. There could be a lot going on when you do a simple read. But locally, the interface it provides to our neighborhood is very simple. Readable is more complicated because readable it requires volatile readable in its prologue. And I'm going to give that a special meaning, which is going to sound a little weird, but I think it give, makes it useful. I'm going to say that by requiring another capability in our prologue, we're declaring that our capability observes the past in a direction indicated by um, volatile readable. So this points our capability at the past. Readable looks at some past event. Contrary to that, we have volatile writable. It requires readable in its epilogue. It, it affects the future in the direction marked by volatile readable. And this gets back to causal nexes. An event that, that claims volatile writable in its epilogue necessarily has a causal nexus with a later event that requires readable in its prologue. This is how change is, commu is communicated. Volatile writable affects a future use of plain readable. It doesn't actually affect a future use of volatile readable in any, in any recognizable way, because every use of volatile readable looks alike. You have exactly the same potential outcomes, and there is nothing you can do to predict them. But under some circumstances, the result of doing a non-volatile read is predictable. Some non-volatile reads are like some other non-volatile reads in that they point to past events that look alike. Uh, moving a bit further, we get writable and fully, yes, fully non-volatile writable is a capability that faces entirely forward. It, looks not, it doesn't look at the past at all, but it affects, it affects things going forward that, uh, and in particular, it has a causal nexus with readable. It doesn't actually have a causal nexus with, well, it, it has a minimal causal nexus with volatile writable, I suppose. Um, that's not a really detectable change because volatile writable doesn't look at the past. Um, so this is the picture of how writable affects a future readable. And it contains all of readable as a latent capability. So it can actually affect the future in a controlled way. 
After doing a non-volatile write, we can talk about what a future read is going to look like. And in fact, that shows up in the interfaces for um, reading. Well, here is the interface for volatile reading. We, we create a new non-volatile byte from our volatile byte. Um, indiscernible here means we don't know how the, uh, what, we don't know what this thing that we just created observes about the past. <laughs> um, regular readable is different from that. A regular read, a non-volatile read, um, can make a claim about um, the relationship between the um, capabilities that it's producing. So we now have two readable entities on the two capabilities of read. We have two readabilities coming out of this function. Ah. We have two capabilities, two readabilities coming out of this, um, uh, out of this read, the old one and the new one. And what we are saying here is that these two capabilities observe past events that are essentially interchangeable. We can't tell the difference between what one of them is looking at and what the other one is looking at. And of course, if you, if you haven't caught on already, this is my dancing around saying they have the same value without saying they have the same value. <laughs> Writable, similar. Um, after writing, things are readable. And after doing a non-volatile write, the thing you wrote to is now substitutable in, for the thing you wrote from. Here, substitutable always refers to the common, the common proper capability. So here it's const proper, because the thing we read from is const, has to be substitutable for the const proper of the thing we, we um, wrote to. Um, OK, so that's substitutability is this thing that uh, links disparate capabilities together, saying that they observe similar events in the past. Um, and um, I should point out, substitutability is not actually a capability. It has different semantics. It's, some, it's a fragile connection between things at a distance. Um, but I will move on. Um, a couple years ago, I gave a talk in which substitutability um, played a large part. And afterward, John really grilled me on what do I mean by substitutability? And I didn't have a pithy way to say what I meant by substitutability. But if I had, I can now extend that conversation and say, here is a pithy thing I can say about substitutability. Substitutability is local knowledge of equality. Substitutability is a necessarily local thing. Equality, on the other hand, is something bigger. And that leads us to how this is wrong. This, you can take it to heart. This is the ladder one may climb up towards enlightenment on. But to achieve enlightenment, you have to discard this ladder. Equality is the omniscient expectation of substitutability in every neighborhood, if only everybody knew. And if you are following along, you might realize that if equality is omniscient, equality is non-local. We will banish equality from our thinking here. But substitutability, substitutability is local. We can keep that. Now, when I banish equality, I don't want to banish this. This is an interface that your implementation should provide. 
Um, if, if equality is a function that gives us a Boolean, and if that Boolean is true, the things that we compared will be substitutable. And I have another thing to say about equality, which is that your implementation should also provide this theorem. Claim implementation, by the way, means the proof is off in another neighborhood. This is a theorem. Um, I really got lost right here. You said that if the operator double equals returns true, that the two objects are substitutable. That's not true in C++. Ah, John points out that if the, uh, well, that I said if operator equals returns true, then the two objects are substitutable, and he says that's not true in C++. And I'm going to say it is true for bytes in C++. So it's it's not, not true for bytes in C++? Uh, he claims it is not true for bytes in C++. I suspect the reason he thinks that is complicated, and I'm going to have to take it after the talk. Yes? Uh, I think maybe the reason could be because the addresses are different. So ah. The, the suggestion is that the reason is that the addresses are different. And really the point of substitutability is that it is possible for things that are distant to be substitutable for each other. It is, po yes or not, um, if they are backward looking. Um, but the readability, it is possible for the readability of one, ob uh, of one byte to be substitutable for the readability of an entirely different byte. We could use either one and get the same effect in a function. It's really easy to explain. Like, if you allocate memory from one allocator and put it back to another one, that's no good. You have to, you have to put uh, it back where you went. Yes, John wants, uh, wants to add that if you allocate memory from one allocator and try to put it back in another one, then you have a, the, then, um, they are, it, that's not okay. Right. And I would say that that means that deallocatability for one allocator is not the same as deallocatable for the other one. Those, are, those would have different elements. Okay. Substitutability is between things of the same element. Okay. Sorry. That, no. No, 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 no. I didn't mean to say exactly. Strike that last sentence. <laughs> um, so, getting towards the end of the talk, um, the question that's still hanging is when do separate assertions assert the same locally atomic capability? That is, when are we talking about the same capability and when are we talking about different ones? When, when do they have different elements? Um, and that's actually similar to a question that came up last year, which I will um, phrase a little differently. When do separate function calls, separate events of calling a function, produce substitutable results? When is A plus B, the over here, going to give us something that is substitutable for C plus D over here? And these are actually both part of the same question. When are locally atomic events interchangeable? When do they have that property that things of the same element have? When can they be swapped without anyone being the wiser? And my answer for that is a little complicated. Locally atomic events are interchangeable when in their prologues, the execution paths are identical, corresponding directly asserted capabilities are substitutable, and corresponding directly required capabilities are interchangeable. <clears throat> so I want to um, set, make a note about directly here. Um, if in the prologue of a function, I claim readable for some object, readable is claimed directly. But in the interface of readable, 
there is, an impl there is a claim of addressable. Addressable is claimed indirectly. So what I'm saying in my, in my prologue is that readable is important to, how this, uh, to what the outcome of this operation is going to be. But addressable doesn't matter, or at least that one statement does not say that addressable matters, even though it has been asserted and it's a capability that is crossing the boundary, it's still going to be addressable in the, in, in the implementation. <laughs> But what I, and that is, again, a long-winded way of, without saying value, saying the value is what matters, not the address. Um, and this is what it means, I think, for two locally atomic events to be interchangeable. And of course, if they use require, they are events that are, a, that are naming a capability. Yes. Just to clarify, had we, in your example, asserted addressable directly in addition to readable, that would have mattered and substitutability for that locale changes? Yes. Uh, the, the, the point is, if you directly assert um, addressable, and in fact, there was one place where addressable was directly implicitly asserted. Um, then the address matters. If you directly assert it, it's going to matter. Um, what this buys us is actually very similar. If locally atomic events are interchangeable, then in their epilogues, you will get the same execution path. You will get corresponding directly asserted capabilities are substitutable. That is, um, particularly, the result, the readability of the result, is going to be substitutable for the readability of the other result. Um, and corresponding directly required capabilities will be interchangeable. So if going in, if you make it to the implementation point with everything being alike, then you will make it out of the interface with everything being alike in the appropriate ways here. Um, so this gives us a way to express just what matters to a function and just what matters, what, it, what is discernible about its output. Yes? I'm wondering about the execution paths being identical in a concurrent scenario that is not visible ah. outside of the implementation. So the... the the question, the point, is that I'm saying something about the execution paths being identical, and that's going to be a little weird when concurrency gets into the issue, and, the, and there isn't a clear execution path, but rather a non-deterministic um, arrangement of events. And that is a very interesting point, um, and it comes down to what, is, what does it mean to say that this non-deterministic arrangement of events is identical to this non-deterministic arrangement of events? And I think it comes out with a very useful answer that I won't talk about today. <laughs> um, I've only got a little bit of time left. I want to tell you the one other thing that comes out of having interchangeable events. Branches are events. Interchangeable branches have correlated outcomes. And that's how we know that in this, um, this function, there is an execution path. The execution path on the left is something that might happen. The execution path on the middle is something that might happen. The execution path on the right never happens because the two branches are interchangeable and must have correlated outcomes. That is, we're testing the same, we are testing substitutable conditions, and when you, when you test substitutable conditions, you get the same result. So that's super important to reasoning about our programs. This is how we know 
certain execution paths never happen. Yes, Bryce. I'm sort of confused about the first two. Uh, never mind. Never mind. Okay. Yes, Alistair. I don't know, I'm missing something, or we have three identical pieces of source, and we say the first two identical pieces happen, and the uh, third identical piece does not. This is the same fun. Th this is three images of the same function, each showing a different execution path. Um, so these are three execution paths you might imagine through this code, two of which actually can happen, and one of which cannot ever happen, for entirely local reasons. That is, everybody in this room should be able to read this code and say, this third path never happens. And that's also important to our tracking of capabilities. Because it's OK if on the path that never happens, the capabilities don't balance out right. This function is perfectly fine, even though we could imagine this path where the capabilities don't balance. Because we can also, by knowing which branch events are interchangeable, um, know that that path never happens. So that's kind of, you know, you've seen all of the meat of this, but I'm going to point out the implications. If you compile a neighborhood so that it tracks every capability that goes in and out, so we will have to have interfaces on, on the neighborhood and everything it calls. Compile a neighborhood so that it tracks the local capabilities without regard to anything in the rest of the program. And it tracks the substitutability between those local capabilities with, again, without regard to what's substitutable for something in another part of the program or whether or not things are equal. Substitutability is what you keep track of. Then you can just pick an execution path through your neighborhood and walk along it doing all of that tracking and see if the capabilities add up correctly. And you can do that without actually running your caller and without actually running any implementation of a function you call. With this, we can do in vitro testing of a neighborhood. We can isolate it from the rest of the program, shoot the, uh, sh you know, run it across various execution paths that maybe we choose at random or by some smarter method, and just see if it balances out. Ooh, the room got quiet. And on that note, I will hit my conclusion. So I will say locally atomic events relate to each other through capabilities. And there's a note there about how a causal nexus is formed. Locally atomic capabilities expose their relationships to each other in their interfaces by looking at the past or affecting the future. The exposed relationships affect the neighborhood, the calling neighborhood, through substitutability. Substitu substitutability is something that is created and it remains around in a fragile state until it is destroyed by a change. And finally, track, if you track the capabilities and the substitutability, you get in vitro testing of a neighborhood. And with that, I will go to questions. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether this applies or it's too low level, but uh, you can have registers that are on writable yeah. and they're readable. Like, you know, ah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the <laughs> point is that it is possible for a hardware register to be only writable and never readable. And I think that's um, not writable and readable in quite the sense here. That is a different sort of capability that is actually 
somewhat weirdly rearranged from writable, and I haven't really worked deeply with them because things like that are so rare. But I think that is its own particular sort of capability. Um, yes? Yeah, I, I, uh, you kind of asked about, answered my question, but I just wanted to note that like, there is even more sick stuff that hardware does. And I think all of this just works as long as you assume that the hardware is uh, acting in some specified way, right? Ah, like uh, yeah. The, many control paths, like writing to another variable could have completely other side effects, mm -hmm. maybe on the first variable or something. Yes, the, the, the point is that there is other weird hardware there, there, and I. I'm I'm going to more generally say, I only focused on a few capabilities here, and they have their own particular interfaces. But the goal of this is that it scales. That you know, if you have a capability that doesn't work the way these do that you can write an interface for that capability. And that in your programs, you're going to write complex capabilities and hide them behind thin interfaces so that other parts of the program can use your library, say, without knowing how the capabilities are implemented. And how to actually write the implementation of a capability and what the rules that must be followed are is really a topic for another talk. Ah, uh, anything else? Yes. Uh, have you ever implemented this? Like, run this ah, program? have I ever implemented this? Uh, not exactly as shown in this talk, and not well in any sense. Um, I've got a kind of hacky thing I can do to test things out. Um, so, no, uh, I'm kind of hoping that someone will do a quality implementation at some point. Yes? Now I'm going to ask my question. Ah. <laughs> so, we're talking about asserts, and, and you said that asserts that have side effects as part of their predicates are okay, in some sense. Yes. I don't ah. understand. I don't understand ah. The question is, well, I, I, I told John that it's okay for assertions to have side effects within them. And I will repeat a bit here that doing anything has side effects. Comparing two strings has side effects both outside the program, heat death of the universe, inside the program, pointers get incremented. So. It is not that assertions don't have side effects. Assertions have a, need to have, be limited in the side effects they can have. Particularly, they need to be limited in how they affect the surrounding neighborhood. So, so let me see if I can just ask. So when you say side effect, you don't mean the same kind of side effect that every other program has. <laughs> John, John quibbles about my definition of si that my definition of side effect is unreasonably broad. Um, I have not found that programmers clearly agree on any very specific notion of side effect beyond that. So, yes. So, you spoke about flux that it needs to be net zero from interface to implementation, well, I mean, the... No net in, flux in the interface. input to interface to output to interface, there needs to be zero flux. But I don't think it's quite like that. Ah, I misspoke. Um, uh, I, I will say what, what, what I do think is true, and then you, you can okay. um, say if this matches your thought. Um, if I gave the impression that nothing created in the interface, in, in the prologue, can continue to, no capability that enters the prologue by a function call, say, um, that that capability must go away before the implementation is reached. That's not true. That capability must not 
go to the implementation. That capability has to remain unavailable to the implementation, but can be used in the epilogue. I, um, sorry, I, I okay. tried to say what you said. <laughs> oh, okay, so this is a different question. My, my point is, let's say you, you, apart from your function argument, you take a logger, and mm -hmm. in your assertion, you log. Mm -hmm. That is a capability, so, sorry, that's a side effect that escapes the local thing. However, the logger remains roughly equivalent as far as the implementation is concerned, right? That's, so the, the question now is, what about if you want to log something in your interface? Um, you, do, you do you create a logging capability in your interface or do you use an existing capability? No, let's say I capability? get it as an input. Okay, so you have taken, uh, if you take the logger as an input, it has, it has the ability to produce a log message. Um, if you take the logger as an input into your interface, then that capability must go to the implementation. If, on the other hand, you pull a logger out of thin air by making some call from your interface, you get a, a that say you know give me a lock on the global logger or something you pull it out of thin air it it didn't come through from the caller then that logger you get has still has capability to make a side effect out there in some other in the world but that do, that that logger must not go to the implementation and must not go back to the caller you have to get rid of it within the interface. So the capabilities are conserved. The side effect, well, I didn't say anything about side effects being conserved. <laughs> so we should, we should oh. probably, we're, we're a couple minutes over. Um, so just so that people are aware, we're, we're cutting into break now. Okay, we, we, we are cut, cutting into break now and, okay. Mm -hmm.